again, great pleasure to uh, to welcome you all at uh, this uh, public but uh, virtual event. And I can't say how much we are looking forward to see everybody kind of uh, back in in person. I think you know the institute has been doing relatively well, but it's the uh, it's the one-to-one uh, -one and the physical physical contact that we're missing very much. Uh, but anyhow, I'm uh, delighted to introduce the speaker of today, uh, Sabine Schmidtke. Sabine was just telling us that uh, you know how active she has been uh, in in the virtual world and uh, you know, with your colleagues all literally all around the world and uh, and been perhaps even more active. It's very hard to imagine, Sabine, that you're. Your activity level could yet step up one 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 step further, but you, I think you didn't uh, done so. So Sabine is really a, a powerhouse uh, in her field. She joined the institute in 2014. Uh, she's a leading expert and 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 force of nature, I would say, in the study of the Islamic intellectual history. Her, her research illuminates the uh, ancient interconnections among Muslims, Jews, and Christians. And she's deeply involved in the exploration of uh, the, the so many unedited and unknown theological and philosophical writings and uh, has applied her rigorous study to the editing and critical analysis of manuscripts in Arabic and Judo-Arabic and, and Persian. Uh, she has earned um, wide acclaim with all, all her efforts. In particular, I would like to highlight the Zaidi Manuscript Tradition Project, a uh, quite visionary enterprise devoted to preserving uh, a very dynamic body of literature, theology, astronomy, legal sources, and other materials that span a an, an millennium. It's the oldest branch of Shia Islam, and it's a uniquely rich trend of cultural heritage, um, uh, which extends almost exclusively in Yemen, is also under imminent threat of annihilation. And uh, Zabina has also been, I think, you know, very vocal, uh, rightly so, a uh, voice of attending the world of uh, you know, the great uh, cultural heritages that are under threat. And um, we are very much aware of uh, events in the past that destroyed uh, a lot of our culture. But it's, uh, it's been so good that you let us know so often that you know um, the present is, in that say, not much better than the past. And mm -hmm. it's something that we should all worry about. Sabina received her DPhil in 1990 from Oxford University. I think she was inspired by the Latin and Greek instructions she received in high school uh, in her native home of Germany and studied Hebrew, Arabic, and Persian in college and graduate school. Uh, Sabine was a diplomat in the German Foreign Office for eight years before embarking on her professional academic career. So I always felt that after George Kennan, we have like a second, uh, second case where a diplomatic career actually uh, turns out to be a great uh, great schooling for, uh, I would say, an even more illustrious uh, scholarly career. There are many, many prizes and awards. Um, mention a few, the World Prize for the Book of the Year, the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, the Written Heritage Center Prize for scholarly, scholarly Achievements in the Study of Twelfth Shiism, the Dahlen Research School Award for Excellent Supervision, and uh, last year, the Humboldt Research Award. Uh, today, Zabina will talk uh, with us about the importance of scholarly correspondences in the academic research and publications and the evolution of ideas in the historiography of oriental studies written large during the late modern period. Uh, so it's great pleasure to welcome all of you, in particular, of course, to welcome Zabina here. And the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Um... Robert, for the very kind introduction and for the invite to, to speak to all of you today, and thanks for coming. As consumers of scholarship, we are as a rule limited to what has come down to us in published form. If you want to understand the DNA of the final product, what it was that prompted a scholar to approach a certain topic or problem, how he or she selected and analyzed the material at hand, and what guided him or her throughout the process, we need to get our hands on some of the material that reflects the genesis of the published work. And this in light of the wider social, political and intellectual context as a scholar is working in, as well as the material and economic constraints. <clears throat> Occasionally, some of these questions are addressed in the publications themselves, in the preface, the acknowledgements, the annotations, etc. 
But whatever is said there has passed through a careful process of filtering, polishing, selecting, and possibly self-censorship. The more authentic raw material is typically found among what has never been intended for publication. It may include any kind of working material or no and notes, such as readers' margin notes in books, excerpts and study notebooks, reader registers, inventory of, inventories of personal libraries, drafts, as well as diaries. With the history of knowledge and knowledge transmission increasingly coming to the forefront of scholarship, some of this material has come to the attention of scholars in recent years and has been studies in a systematic studied in a systematic manner, as in the Andrew Mellon Foundation-funded project, The Archaeology of Reading in Early Modern Europe, exploring historical reading practices throughout the lens of manuscript annotations preserved in early printed books, my own current book project, an archaeological inquiry into texts and their transmission among 12 Shi thinkers over some six centuries, or the ERC-funded project, Project uh, Nota, studying medieval notebooks written primarily in Latin. Another genre that is particularly fruitful in the reconstruction of a scholar's intellectual trajectory are epistolary exchanges. Letters and letter collections are ubiquitous. We encounter this genre from antiquity until today and in virtually all cultures and languages. Some disciplines, such as medieval and early modern European history, are very advanced in the study and handling of this important historical source, others less so. Scholars in the humanities, past and present, scholarship in the humanities, past and present, appears to be a solitary undertaking as the single authored publication, be it a monograph or journal article, continues to be the predominant end product. And indeed, creativity and originality in research often flourishes best when the scholar has the privilege of complete seclusion, at least temporarily, to focus on the material and reflect on its interpretation. The Institute for Advanced Study is one of those places offering such favorable conditions. But this is only half the truth. Scholars in the humanities and historians in particular at all times benefit from the support of a network of peers, be it by sharing material, by reading, discussing, commenting, and criticizing each other's works, work, etc. During the 19th and early 20th century, before photography and microfilm technology became available and affordable, entertaining a close network of peers was indispensable to gain access to and circulate knowledge. Scholars were typically limited to their local library, with access perhaps to some other libraries in their immediate vicinity. Traveling from one city or in country to another to visit different libraries and transcribe the manuscripts one needs for one's own research was time consuming and costly. Especially in a field like Islamic studies, where manuscripts continue to be the bread and butter of virtually all historical research, the limited access to only a few libraries poses a serious impediment to scholarship. Providing colleagues with excerpts of manuscripts one had access to, checking references, or collating each other's work with the manuscripts within one's reach, keeping each other informed about new publications and discoveries, discussing new findings, reading each other's drafts, purchasing books on behalf of others whenever, whenever opportunities arose, arose and of course, exchanging off prints and publications were indispensable for scholars during those days. Most of this happened through the medium of letters. In the field I'm concerned with, Oriental studies during the late modern period, the scholars involved, European scholars for the most part, but also some that were based outside of Europe, constituted a veritable republic of letters. The material that has come down to us is voluminous. The relevant holding institutions increasingly understand the value of the treasures they possess and the preparation of detailed inventories and digitization of entire corpora of correspondence is on the rise. Prominent examples include the correspondence by and or addressed to Ignaz Goldseer, the doyen of Arabic and Islamic as well as Jewish studies during his lifetime, 
consisting of close to 14,000 letters in 10 languages, German, Hungarian, French, English, Hebrew, Arabic, Italian, Spanish, Yiddish, and Russian, held by the Hungarian Academy of Science in Budapest. The archive of Paul Kahle in Turin, which comprises the correspondence of this renowned Hebraist, Semitist, and scholar of Islamic studies with more than 2,500 correspondents. The recently discovered Eugenio Golfini archive in Milan, which sheds light, an entirely new light on the history of Yemeni manuscript collections in Italy and Germany, complementing the archives of the Austrian explorer and scholar Eduard Glaser, the eponym of the Glaser collections of Yemeni manuscripts. All the correspondence of the German geographer and explorer Karl Ratjens with some 1,080 correspondents around the world, including the ruling Imam of Yemen, Yahya Hamiduddin, during the 20s and 30s, and Hamburg. The picture that evolves from a mere quantitative analysis of the preserved materials is that of a close-knit, comprehensive network of scholars beyond denominational, national, and disciplinary boundaries. Mention should also be made of the rich and so far unexplored correspondence of former IS faculty member Otto Neugebauer and his collaborators revolving around their joint projects in Near Eastern mathematics and astronomy, which is kept in the Shelby White and Leon Levi Archives Center here at the Institute for Advanced Study. Studying the historiography of our own discipline has many merits. It helps us to better understand our own doing as scholars, to reflect on our methods and objectives, and to evaluate our own achievements in view of those of our forebears, often realizing that progress in the humanities is an elusive concept. Our entrance to this fascinating world of our forebears, separated from us only by only a few generations, while at the same time representing a world that has long passed and is at times hard to grasp, is often prompted by chance finds. A letter, an image, an archival source, or just a small footnote. More often than not, we are stumbling into lives that are nothing but tragic, and we encounter gems of scholarship that never made it through the press. A case in point is the Hungarian scholar Martin Schreiner, a representative of the science of Judaism and Islamic studies at the turn of the 20th century, and the founder of modern study of the Mu'tazila, a rationalist current within Islamic theology, whose scholarly career came to an abrupt end in April 1902 at the age of 39, when he was diagnosed with mental illness and hospitalized in a private psychiatric clinic in Berlin. Schreiner's mental disorder put a painful and sudden end to a rich, albeit brief, career of a prolific and versatile scholar. He lingered on for another two decades until his demise on October 9, 1926. The Hungarian Academy of Sciences in Budapest preserves 157 letters from Schreiner to his erstwhile, erstwhile teacher in Budapest, Skolzia, written between 1887 and 1901 in Hungarian, Hebrew, and Arabic. The two scholars regularly discussed their ongoing scholarly work and personal concerns, included off-prints of their respective publications, shared materials such as excerpts of manuscripts with each other, and discussed recent contributions to the field. Besides providing unique insights into Schreiner's biography, his personality, and his interactions with the surroundings, as well as the world of scholars he interacted with in Hungary and Germany, his Hebrew and Arabic letters in particular are particularly noteworthy as they beautifully emulate the Talmudic and the classical Arabic conventions respectively, as was typical for his time. The corpus of his epistolary exchanges is complemented by the archive of his personal papers in the National Library of Israel, which show us the scholar at work. The archive comprises teaching notes, outlines of publications he planned to write, excerpts from Arabic manuscript and secondary sources, an inventory of his personal library, as well as numerous drafts, some close to final form, of books and articles that were never published. Moreover, we are also accurately informed about the manuscripts he consulted during his active years in Berlin on the faculty of the Hochschule für die Wissenschaft des Judentums, 1894 through uh, 1902. 
Despite Schreiner's tragic fate, from a historian's point of view, the sources available provide an ideal basis for the study of his intellectual trajectory, which I hope to complete very soon. In what follows, I want to discuss two further scholars of Islamic studies who flourished in Germany during the late 19th and the first half of the 20th century, namely Friedrich Kern and Rudolf Strothmann. Both Kern and Strothmann entered the discipline through unusual paths, and both chose to remain in the margins of mainstream scholarship during their time, though in entirely different ways. At the same time, the contributions they made to scholarship were cutting edge, although they are, for no good reason, mostly forget, forgotten today. Moreover, neither Kern nor Strothmann left behind any personal papers, study notes, or correspondence, and it is only through the archival remains of others that their respective trajectories can be reconstructed. Let me add a brief personal note. I stumbled upon Kern when working on my monograph on Martin Schreiner, who mentions him once or twice in his letters. Beside a brief obituary by one of his friends, I found virtually nothing about Cairn, but was intrigued by the sheer mass of the 800 or so manuscripts that he consulted at Berlin State Library over the course of two decades. My interest in Rudolf Strothmann, on the other hand, arose from my own work in Shi Islam and the fact that with one intermediate, I'm a pupil of Strothmann. At the same time, and similar to the case of Kern, I was struck by the fact that virtually nothing is known about his life, with the exception of two brief obituaries that were published after his demise in 1960. My point of departure for both was their respective correspondence with the aforementioned Kreuzier. In the case of Kern, the correspondence constituted the single richest source for the reconstruction of his scholarly trajectory and extremely difficult personality. Goldseer also exchanged letters with Kern's mother and brother-in-law, Kern's former doctoral advisor, and his, and his close friends in Berlin. Kern's difficulties in getting a grip on his life helped the biography of, biographer of today. Since his friends and close family members were continuously worrying about him, they mention him and his doings regularly in the correspondence between them. In the case of Strothmann, the discovery of his correspondence with Goldsier was only the first step to retrieving his epistolary exchanges with many other scholars and peers, each one of them covering different periods of his life. The correspondence also includes the official letters Strothmann sent to the authorities of Hamburg University and the ministries in charge between 33 and 45. These shed valuable life on the restrictions and possibilities for German scholars in the humanities during the years of National Socialism and World War II, and the ways to maneuver them. Friedrich Kern was born July 28, 1874 in Gleiwitz in Upper Silesia, nowadays Poland, into a prosperous Jewish family. Though the family is said to have taken pride in the Jewish tradition, the Kern household was apparently not a religious one, nor does Kern seem to have received a thorough Jewish education. On December 30, 1894, Kern even converted to Protestantism. Friedrich's father suffered from poor health, and after he retired, the family moved to Berlin, where Friedrich enrolled in the Joachim Thalsche Gymnasium. At the time of his father's demise in 1890, Friedrich was still a, major, a minor. He never married, but apparently spent most of his short adult life in the company of his mother. In the curriculum vitae, which is appended to his doctoral dissertation, Kern summarizes his academic foundation. He relates that he studied at the universities of Lausanne, Jena, Berlin, and Leipzig. Between 1894 and May 1896, even before completing his grad studies in Europe, Kern spent some time in Cairo. He also provides here a list of his teachers at the various universities he attended, which gives some idea of the wide range of his interest during those years. The list of teachers and their respective disciplines corroborates the impression of his doctoral advisor, Carl Follers, that Kern's academic trajectory was somewhat torn. Kern submitted his doctoral dissertation to Jena University, which is, was approved on June 8, 1898. 
On several occasions in the same year and again in 1890, Cairns spent some time in Budapest where he studied as a visiting scholar under the tutelage of Goldseer. Can again spent extended periods of time in Cairo over the next years, and he returned to the city in 1906 and 7. During his sojourns in Cairo, he prepared an edition of a work of jurisprudence by the famous exegete and historian Atabari, delved deeply into the local book market and the manuscript collections of the Khedive Library, and pursued his many other scholarly interests. Since 1902, Cairns seems to have spent most of his time in Berlin, although he continued to travel frequently and for extended periods of time, mostly accompanying his mother. Thanks to the bequest left by his father, Cairns had the means to support himself throughout his adult life. There are few indications that he ever sought, sought a paid position, and he apparently had no financial barrier to pursuing his scholarly interests. On the contrary, we learn from his letters that he spent considerable amounts of money on purchasing books and even ordered photographs of manuscript codices whenever he found them relevant for his work, something that was extremely costly and truly exceptional during this period. Among the many interests Kern pursued was the study of the dogmatic history of Hanafism and Maturidism, a largely neglected field at the time and a difficult one to embark on in view of the problematic situation of the sources and the thorny question of the authenticity of writings attributed to Abu Hanifa, the putative founder of the earliest surviving school of Islamic law, and Al-Maturidi, the eponymous founder of the Maturidi school of theology, which developed within Hanafism in Transoxania. The data are provided by the Register of Readers at the Berlin State Library in Kern's correspondence with Goldsia reveal his long and deep involvement in the study of Hanafism and Maturidism, and his close familiarity with most relevant sources and the accent manuscripts in Berlin and beyond. An accomplished philologist with a rigorous historical critical approach to the sources, Kahn began his exploration of Hanafism and Maturidism by focusing on the two eponyms and the writings, attempting to distinguish the authentic from the inauthentic, and advancing over the years towards a fairly nuanced picture of the different strands of thought among Transoxanian scholars, both before and after al -Maturidi. Since most of his discoveries and observations remained unpublished and were eventually lost, his findings were never consulted by later scholars engaged with the topic. It was only decades later that those conclusions were again reached, but in some respects, Kant's findings are still more refined than what is today considered to be the state of the art. The reasons why none of his publication plans came to fruition were manifold. Kant's widespread interest in a vast range of topics and literary traditions was without any doubt one of them. Friedrich Kern passed away on August 21, 1921 at the age of 47. We are better informed about Rudolf Strothmann, who was born on September 4, 1877 in Lengerich in North Rhine-Westphalia into a Lutheran family. Strothmann received his early education in his hometown of Lengerich Wächte, and in July 1897, he received his high school uh, certificate from the Arnoldinum in nearby Steinfurt. Strothmann embarked on a career as a theologian. In October 1897, he enrolled at Halle University, where he spent four terms. His study program was that of a typical student of Protestant theology. While in Halle, Strothmann also began to study Hebrew. He spent the academic year 1899-1900 in Bonn, where he continued his formation as a theologian. In addition, he began to delve into Oriental studies, attending some courses in Syriac studies. Strothmann engage, Strothmann's engagement with both Syriac and Hebrew must have been continuous and intensive as he became an accomplished Hebraist and Syriacist. In the autumn of 1902, Strothmann moved to Münster, not far from Lengerich, his birthplace, where he served as a high school teacher until 1907. During his year in Münster, Strothmann continued to attend courses at the local university. Although Semitic languages were not taught there at the time, it is likely that it, he uh, attended the reading classes in Hebrew and Aramaic. 
From October 1907 until uh, 1923, he filled the double post as a, of a senior teacher and a deacon at the prestigious boarding school, uh, school of Schulforta in Saxony-Anhalt, which was famed for its classical education. Strutmann relates on various occasions that it was Karl Brockelmann, author of the renowned Geschichte der Arabischen Literatur, who enticed him towards Arabic and Islamic matters. The two had met by pure chance in Warnemünde, a seaside resort on the Baltic Sea near Rostock, possibly in 1903 or 4. At some point, Brockelmann steered Strutmann's attention towards Shi uh, Zaidi Shiism and the impressive collections of Zaidi Yemeni manuscripts that had recently arrived in Europe. This corpus included the manuscript collections that had been brought together by Glaser and sold to libraries in Berlin, London, and Vienna, as well as those collected by Capotti, which were purchased by the Bavarian State, State Library in Munich and by the Biblioteca Ambrosiana in Milan. Strothmann primarily worked on the codices held in Berlin and his first visit, visit to the State Library took place in October 1908. Over the following years, he spent every vacation in Berlin. Detailed information about Strothmann's manuscript work in the State Library can be gleaned from the Register of Readers of Oriental Manuscripts in the Library. Strothmann also had access during those years to some manuscripts held in Leiden, London, Milan, Munich, and Vienna. The first fruit of Strutman's endeavor was an extended Historia Bibliographical Overview article of Zaidi Shizm, which was published in two installments in the journal Der Islam in 1910 and 11. His overall aim was to, to study three main aspects of Zaidism, namely political doctrines, religious practices, and civil law, in order to situate this idea between mainstream Sunnism on the one hand and Twelver Shizm on the other. On March 1st, 1911, Strothmann submitted to Halle University his doctoral dissertation, which he had prepared under the supervision of Karl Borkelmann. In 1912, he published the Staatsricht der Zaiditen, containing his doctoral dissertation and the completion of the study. In the same year, he published a second monograph on the history of religious practices. His planned third volume on civil law was never published. On March 14, 1911, Strothmann wrote to his Italian colleague, Graffini, that he had essentially completed the study and that it had been accepted for publication. Strothmann hesitated, however, to go ahead with the finalization and publication of the study, as he had not yet seen the allegedly earliest legal codex attributed to Zaid bin Ali, the eponymous founder of this idea, that Graffini intended to publish. Eager to avoid any conflict with him, Strothmann even offered to let go of the project. Rufini's reply has not come down to us, but there's no indication that he encouraged Strothmann to pursue his plans to publish the third volume. Moreover, Strothmann's in inquiry a few months later in a letter dated June 19, 1911, as to whether he might spend the summer vacation of 1911 in Milan to consult the Zaid bin Ali Codex in the Ambrosiana Library was evidently turned down by Graffini. Apparently, the latter planned to spend the summer period outside of Milan, and he seems to have been unwilling to let Strothmann consult any manuscripts without being around himself. It is interesting to observe that Strothmann, who usually wrote to Graffini in German, addressed him in Italian whenever he sensed that Graffini felt offended, evidently trying to appease him, as was the case with this letter written at the end of June, 1911. After the end of World War I, when Strutman was able to resume his scholarly work, his plans had apparently, apparently shifted in more than one way. What ultimately prevented him from publishing the third book on Zaidism is unclear. Rufini's edition of the Zaid bin Ali legal codex had been published by the, this time, so that it is unlikely that he opposed Strutman's plan, plans in any way. It is possible that this project was thwarted by the overall poor economic situation during the 20s. Publishing academic books in Germany during the chaotic period of, hype, of, of hyperinflation was largely impossible. Strothmann now focused primarily on Twelverschism. 
But the lack of sources and especially the difficulty of accessing lithograph prints of many of the imami classics, which had been published since the second half of the 19th century in Iran and India, constituted a far greater challenge than that which he had faced with the relevant Zaidi materials. In addition, Strothmann became increasingly interested in another branch of Shiism, Ismailism, another topic for which he could initially access only very limited materials. The difficulties to gain access to the relevant primary sources seems to have been the principal reason that prompted Strothmann to leave Schulporter to pursue an academic career. And in 1923, he secured an appointment to the chair for Semitic studies in Gießen. Strothmann brought together a systematic collection for the study of travel Shism, first in Gießen and then in Hamburg, where he taught from 27 until uh, on his retirement in 47. His efforts to build up a collection of Shi literature in Hamburg were largely, largely nullified when in July 43, the entire holdings of the Institute Library of the Department of the His for the History and Culture of the Near East in ha at Hamburg University were destroyed during a Royal Air Force air attack on the city. The manuscript holdings of the Berlin State Library, some of which Strothmann was still able to consult during a brief visit to Berlin in January 36, were likewise no longer accessible as they were removed from Berlin to protect them during the war. Strothmann's very first visit to the Middle East had taken place during the spring of 1913, which he spent at the German Protestant Institute of Archaeology in Jerusalem. On his way to Jerusalem, Strothmann passed through Milan, where he met Griffini on December 24, 1912, and where he consulted some manuscripts at the Ambrosiana. Later in his life, Strothmann had further opportunities to spend extended periods of time in the Middle East. In 2930, he sojourned for several months in Sana'a, Yemen, as a guest of Imam Yahya. Strothmann's main goal during his visit to Yemen was to establish contacts with the Ismailis in the country, and perhaps more importantly, to gain access to the corpus of some 400 Ismaili manuscripts that had been confiscated by, by Imam Yahya in 1904, and about which he had learned through a publication of Graffini published in 1915. The overall outcome of the trip was disappointing. Strothmann had again, was granted access to only one work held in the Imam's library, namely the Kitab Kawaid Aqaid al Muhammad by the Zaidi author Muhammad Adelam. He presented the first report on the book's anti Ismaili section at the Orientalist in Bonn in 34, and then published a critical edition of this part of the book in 39. In March 39, Strothmann submitted a request for permission and financial support for yet another extended trip to the Middle East during the winter term 39-40. Although his request was initially granted, the trip did not materialize in view of the outbreak of World War II on September 1, 39. Strothmann had planned to visit Iraq, Syria, Palestine, and Istanbul. And the objectives he hoped to pursue during the trip, provide insights into his scholarly interests during the time. His last recorded trip to the Middle East took place in 52. His destinations was Lebanon and Syria, where he sought to converse with Nusairis, an offshoot of Ismailism, Strothmann's principal focus during this time. In view of his pioneering work on the Ismailia, Strothmann's scholarship came to the attention of the scholarly circle of Vladimir Ivanov, arguably the most important scholar of Ismailism during the early 20s, and Asa Faisi, who were based in Bombay and closely collaborated to further the historical text critical study of Ismailism under the patronage of the Aga Khan. In 1933, they founded the Islamic Research Association, and in April 35, they honored Strothmann with, with an appointment as corresponding member of the association. Strothmann felt obliged to publish a book with the association. In summer 39, he completed his edition of the Kitab al Kashf, attributed to Adai Jaf bin Mansur al Yaman, which he dispatched to Bombay. The publication turned into a nightmare. 
With the outbreak of World War II, postal service between Germany and India came to a halt. And this situation continued throughout World War II. For years, Strothmann was left in the dark as to the publication progress. When the book was eventually published in 1952, Strothmann's introduction was completely outdated and he had never received any proofs before publication. Rudolf Strothmann's academic career was marked by several turns and ruptures. The most important was no doubt his appointment to the faculty uh, at, of Gießen University in 23, which allowed him to abandon his earlier career as a, as a high school teacher and deacon at Pforta and to focus henceforth exclusively or, on oriented studies. His 27 appointment at Hamburg University was another important career step as it also made him editor of De Islam, arguably one of the most important journals for German Arabists and Islamists during the two decades of Strothmann's editorship. Strothmann's scholarly trajectory over the course of the five, its five decades reflects his shifting interests, beginning with his early interests in Zaydism, which subsequently led him to delve into Shi Shiism, and then his evolving preoccupation with Ismailism. In parallel, Strothmann was also deeply involved in the history of Eastern Christianity in the Church of the East, and whenever he had the chance, he was an avid observer of the contemporary Middle East and of Islam as a living religion and culture. His, this diversity of interests coexisted with continuity in his scholarship, which moved organically in new directions whenever new material came to his attention. Moreover, his focus on the fringes of Islamic civilization was a conscious decision, as he wrote in his programmatic article of 1938 on the history, history of Islamic heresiography. The continuity of Strobmann's scholarly trajectory is all the more remarkable as his research was conducted under difficult circumstances. During the first decade and a half at Schubforta, Strothmann worked under extreme time constraints, and he also had restricted access to scholarly literature and primary sources. The closest comprehensive library for printed materials was that of the Deutsche Morgenländische Gesellschaft in Halle, and the closest manuscript depository was the Berlin State Library. World War I caused another interruption to Strothmann's research. During the first years of the war, he continued to work in his position at Trotter. From February 17 onwards, he served as military chaplain on the Western Front, and he was released for military service to return to Pforta on Dece December 13, 1918. Although Strothmann was able to spend about a month in Berlin to pursue his studies at the beginning of 1917, he notes in one of his letters that his scholarly work came to a halt during World War I. This is corroborated by his publication history. After an article published in 1913, nothing appeared in print until 21, when a first review appeared again in print. Most of what he wrote during the early years of the war was never published and is probably lost. World War II proved even more devastating as it led to the complete destruction of both Strothmann's personal papers and books and the library of Hamburg University. If I were to summarize, Strobmann's trajectory and his single-handed opening up of the world of Shiism and its three main strands to Western scholarship, and this under extremely difficult circumstances, is admirable. That his work is largely forgotten and for the most part ignored by contemporary scholars is entirely unjustified. Moreover, in view of the vicissitudes of his life, one cannot imagine how much more he would have been able to achieve otherwise. The case of Friedrich Kern is tragic, as next to none of his findings were ever published. Most of what he saw at the time was discovered only decades later, and in no case was anyone aware of his earlier finding, findings, which can be reconstructed only through his letters. Moreover, some of the later discoveries seem questionable in view of Kern's earlier findings and should be reconsidered. The case of Cairn is a telling example that much of what is perceived as progress in scholarship is no progress at all, but often just a rediscovery what earlier long forgotten scholars have already found out. Thank you. <laughs>